off we go. If you're staying in with us, uh, grab your Bibles, open up to the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew. We are wrapping up uh, a sermon series today. Uh, as we kind of move into the summer months and weeks here, we're wrapping, we've been doing a series uh, called Opposition. And, and really we've, uh, for, oh man, it's been like a year and a half now, we've been going through the book of Matthew on and off. You know, we'll, we'll go through a section, we'll stop and we'll do some other stuff and then we'll come back to it. But, but here we are really wrapping up chapter 12. I'm going to be, I'm going to start in verse 38 and we're going to finish up this chapter. So there's several, several different sections to cover here. So we'll do it a little differently. Normally I go through the passage and we kind of do, you know, how do, how do we understand what the Bible says? And then we, we do all that and we come to the end and then we apply it. But we've actually got, at least in my Bible, three sections to cover. One's called the sign of Jonah. Uh, one's called the return of an unclean spirit. And one's called Jesus' mother and brother. So after each one of those, I'll pause and apply uh, so that it's not just like one big long, you know, thing. And then we'll do all the application at the end after you've forgotten the beginning. So just know that'll be a, a little bit different. Uh, but there's a critical question, really that's been building through this whole thing, right? And if you weren't here and missed some of it, they're out on the app, they're out on the website. You can find them on our YouTube channel. Uh, you go out and just search for Gallup Hill. All the old messages are out there if you want to get caught up. But there's a critical question that's been building for this whole section. Uh, and it, the question is, what is it about these Pharisees and this opposition that makes them so resistant to Jesus. And what is it about them that, that makes them kind of, they become the bad guy, right? The, the foils, the, the antagonists. And, and what is it about them that just Jesus drives them crazy? Uh, and then we're going to make an important turn, right, as, as we look at that and think about that. And even though the Pharisees themselves have died off, Right? Does Phariseeism live on today? That's a question we'll ask. And how does Jesus kind of react to that here and in the future? Okay? So that's where we're going. We really, we end this section on opposition to Jesus, right? The, the, the antagonists for Jesus, for really for the rest of the Gospels, kind of crystallize. And we'll also see, though, the forming of some protagonists. Right, the good guys begin to form. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting end of a chapter. So let me pray for us, and we're going to jump right in. Father God, thank you for your word. It speaks. Even though we are 2,000 years removed, Lord, may Matthew and his recollection and his recording of your son Jesus, Father, may those words speak into our minds and into our hearts. Father, today, may, may the scriptures be a mirror that shows us who you are, who your son is, what your church should be like. And Father, let it be a mirror that shows us perhaps what we look like. And then give us the grace, Father, to change. We pray this all through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, listen, guys, I'm going to pick up in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 38. And we'll cover this, uh, at least in my Bible, it's, it's, it's three sections. Yours, it may be two, because the second section really kind of ties into the first. But I'm going to go 38 through 42, and then we'll stop there. All right, so Jesus has been talking, right? He's been talking to the Pharisees. It says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, okay? Jesus has been talking for a little while. He said a bunch of stuff, like, you know, like... If you're not for me, you're, you're against me, right? And if Satan is, is attacking Satan, then how does his house stand? And the, the, the fruit comes from the tree, right? All this kind of stuff. So then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. 
And behold, something greater than Jonah's here. And the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So if, you, if you're taking notes, right, if you want to kind of follow along, I'll give you some thoughts to kind of hang your hat on. They'll be, they'll be up here on the screen. You can write them down on, on phones or tablets or in, in notebooks or whatever you want to do. But just kind of working our way through the story, right, the Pharisees ask Jesus. They demand proof of who he is. And if you're not familiar, right, Pharisees are kind of a conservative religious movement. They're based not in Galilee, where Jesus is. They're based down in Jerusalem to the south. But they send people out to all the villages and, and other areas, and they take their teachings and their interpretations of the Bible and their, in, 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 you know, their uh, gosh, their traditions and all this stuff, and they're, they're like little missionaries that go out. Well, now they've teamed up with a different group, the scribes, and the scribes are like the local religious experts, yes? So the Pharisees are like the national guys down in Jerusalem. The scribes are are the local guys. They're the local biblical experts. They're in the the synagogues, right? And they're the local teachers of Torah. And this is significant, right? Because previously Jesus has had some bump-ins with with both of these groups, Uh, but now they've teamed up. And the local opposition and the national opposition have come together, and it's starting to to kind of crystallize into this group that's going to be the antagonist for the rest of the Gospels. They'll later be joined by a couple of other groups called Herodians and Sadducees, which are kind of the left-leaning folks. But for now... It's the scribes and the Pharisees. And what are they getting all bent out of shape about? Well, it's really this one question all the way back in in the beginning of, of, or excuse me, in the middle of chapter 12. If you want to turn back in your Bibles, it's in verse 23, right? Jesus casts out this demon from this demon-oppressed man. And the people, in verse 23 says, And the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? And that's a messianic question. The people, they're not sure. We talked about this a little bit before. right? The miracles are pointing towards Jesus. The stuff that Jesus is doing, the healings, the power over the demons, all of this stuff is pointing towards, yes, this is in fact the Messiah. But Jesus, like his actions and his person and his demeanor and the fact that he's this itinerant preacher that just kind of travels around with this ragtag band of disciples and he doesn't look very kingly and he doesn't talk very kingly, and he doesn't say kingly stuff. Instead, he says things like, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, and that's just not what they were expecting. So the miracles are making the people go, hmm, I wonder, but the person's making them go, I don't know. Well, the Pharisees, and now the scribes see this, and they go, wait a minute. This guy can't be the Messiah. Right? We know what the Messiah should look like. We know what he should act like. We know what, what the scriptures say he's going to be. We know how he's going to treat our enemies. He's not going to love them. He's going to conquer them. We know that he's going to be this wonderful king that's going to come and restore the kingdom. And we, we know all this stuff. And this guy's not it. Their expectations of what Jesus should be doing and who Jesus should be acting like are not being met. And so the scribes and the Pharisees have come to the conclusion that he's a false messiah. And they're plotting how to destroy him. They think he's leading people astray. They don't think his leadership is good for people. He's also, and we've talked about this before, he's a threat to their power because he's undermining their very legalistic interpretations of the scriptures, right? So Jesus, not only do they believe they have this religious duty to oppose him because they think he's leading the people astray, they've got this kind of this threatening power thing going because what he's doing is undermining their authority and people are starting to pick up on it and they're starting to get excited about it and they set a trap for him, right? And that's all the way back in, in, in the beginning of this chapter. Chapter 12, verse 10, right? And they bring this man with a withered hand into the, 
into the, into the synagogue, and they ask Jesus, is it lawful to heal? And then the next phrase, so that they might accuse him. And then they go out after he heals, and the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy them, okay? So now, what do they do? They come to Jesus again, and they go, well, listen, if you're the Messiah, show us a sign. Give us a sign. And a sign is uh, a miracle. What they're asking for is they want, uh, they want a McMiracle, right? They want a McMiracle. They want just, just an easy, simple, like off the 99 cent menu, right? They're not asking for the Big Mac miracle. They're asking for like the 99 cent fries miracle. Give us a little one that right here, right now, that we can see that you're the Messiah. They want their McMiracle. Do a trick for us, Jesus. And his response, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except that of the sign of Jonah. That's a strong reaction. Jesus looks at them and the people that they will represent and essentially says, you don't get to decide what's of God and what's not. Right? In their pridefulness, they thought they get to impose who God should be and what God should act like. In their selfishness, they thought this is, is how it's going to be done and, and this Messiah should be coming and he should be putting us up on a pedestal and saying, look at these people, aren't they the best? Right? In their self-righteousness, they look at the Messiah and they say, you've got to prove who you are to us. And then maybe we'll sign off on you being the Messiah. And Jesus says, it don't work like that. You will not get your McMiracle. The only thing you'll get is the sign of Jonah. And this is why I had Aaron read that passage this morning, right? What did Jonah do? Jonah was a prophet sent to the city of Nineveh. He doesn't want to go, right? He ends up three days, three nights in the belly of the fish, right? Uh, and then he gets spit out on the beach, and he eventually ends up going and preaching to Nineveh. And it's a foreshadowing there. Jesus is saying, the proof you're going to want, the proof you're going to get, is going to be the sign of Jonah, but you're not going to get it until my crucifixion and my burial, in three days in a tomb, and in my resurrection. That's what's going to prove it. I'm not doing your parlor trick. And so, Jesus calls them out for their spiritual deadness is what's happening here. Right? The men of Nineveh, right? He tells them, the men of Nineveh, the, the, you know, I don't know how much you know about history. The men of Nineveh were awful people. But if you watch the VeggieTale movies, right, they slapped each other with fishes. They were terrible. <laughs> I don't know, that's one of, my, one of my favorites, right? They were fish slappers. <laughs> uh, they were awful people. Uh, Assyria was, was, was one of the most brutal, when, when you think about it, like we look around at, at things that are going on, whether it's ISIS or, you know, all this d different stuff, and we, and we look at the brutality that happens with, you know, Hamas, it, like they had nothing on the Assyrians. Perhaps one of the most brutal people groups that lived ever. Uh, and when Jonah appeared, though, he appears in their capital city, and he begins to preach, and the whole city hears and repents. Like these pagans hear and repent. And this is around, you know, 450 B.C. And, and Jesus says, likewise, right, during the reign of Solomon, 500 years before that, like 950 B.C., the queen of Sheba, this African queen, hears about Solomon and his great wisdom. And she shows up in Jerusalem just to hear. And she believes. She's like, and Jesus is going, listen, these guys just saw a little bit. They just saw Jonah, right? And, and they believed through Jonah. And, and this lady just saw Solomon, and she believed through Solomon. But you guys, right, like how much, if they believe through that, how much more should you believe through me? Something greater. This is what Jesus is saying. Somebody greater than Jonah's here, a greater preacher than Jonah's here, right? A wiser king than Solomon's here. And, and you guys are missing it. 
And he's like, these guys, are they're going to rise up in the day of judgment, and they're going to condemn you not by their words, because that's God's job, but by their actions. They took a lesser revelation, and they believed and repented. But not you guys. And this gets to what I think and what I'm going to land on for this whole section has been building for chapter 12 is that there is nothing more spiritually dead than a Pharisee. There is something about this spiritual pride. Like the Pharisees, they had all this learning, right? They knew the scriptures. They were educated. They studied them constantly. They read other books. They talked to other scholars. They learned the, their learning of the scriptures was way beyond most people. But instead of making them discerning and ready for God, it made them arrogant and prideful and full of themselves. And they were condescending and they looked down on people. And their lives revolved around living out their traditions and their rules and the ways they thought it should be done. And if you did it differently, they criticized and belittled and discouraged you always with something negative to say. They were, people were afraid of them. They loved, though, being thought of as important and influential. And they lusted after important places and positions. To be thought of as spiritual and knowledgeable, right? Their, their self-righteousness was off the charts. Even Jesus didn't meet their standards. He didn't look the part. He didn't dress the part. He didn't act the part. His style of ministry was met, messy, right? It wasn't all buttoned up and nice. Jesus wasn't acceptable to them because their hearts were hard and critical. And they operated right now kind of behind the scenes, plotting and scheming and grumbling and trying to gather allies. They've gathered allies now, right? They're starting to pull together people. There's nothing more spiritually dead and hard than a self-righteous, prideful, confident Pharisee. And if we think about it, right, the official order of the Pharisees, they died out not long after Jesus, right? The temple was destroyed in A.D. 70 by the Romans when the, the Jews rebelled. And, and the order of the Pharisees kind of just slowly died off over the, the decades that followed. But Phariseeism still lives on. And the sad thing is you can find them in many churches across the country. They may not look like Pharisees. They may not call themselves Pharisees. But there is a self-righteousness and a hardness and a bitterfulness and a pridefulness. And they're very difficult to get through to. They're convinced of their own righteousness. And there's nothing Almost nothing. Like Jesus, Jesus is going to, like he's, he's working on these guys. He's going to tell them a parable here in just a second that we're going to look at. He's still trying to break through to them, right? He's, 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 not, he's not at the point yet where he's willing to give up. That's coming. Chapter 16, Jesus walks away from them. And he tells his disciples, don't listen to these guys. Beware of them, their teaching, their influence. For now, he's still trying them. And he tells them this, this little story in Matthew 12. I'm going to pick it up now. This is the next section. Maybe it's just part of the same section in yours. But he says, listen, starting in verse 43. It says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through the waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So it will be with this evil generation. Jesus is telling them, listen, guys, your heart's got to be filled with God. Like that's the only thing that's going to make a difference. Your heart's got to be filled with God. So he tells them a story. He tells them a story about a guy who was possessed by a demon. Unclean spirit, demon, synonyms, right? Possessed by an unclean spirit. And for some reason, that demon leaves. We, don't, we aren't told why, right? Maybe it leaves on its own and decides, you know, hey, I'm going to go find 
better pasture somewhere else. Maybe it's cast out. We're not sure. But the spirit passes out, and it says it kind of goes out over the, into, into the wilderness, and it starts looking for another host, right? And, and it's wandering around. It's seeking rest, another place to, to come, another person, because a, a demon who's not influencing a person is a demon who's not doing his job, right? So he goes out. He doesn't find anything else. And so what does he do? I'll go home. He comes back. And he finds the guy that he had formerly inhabited. He's gotten his life together, right? His house is swept. It's cleaned up. It's buttoned up. It looks good, right? It's put in order, right? This guy now, he's got it all together, right? I mean, look at what it says, right? And when it comes, he finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. The house looks great. It's clean. But the key word there, if you're, if you're an underliner, empty, empty. It's empty, right? The evil abandoned it, but the good never got in. It's, it's this whole thing, we've been talking about it week to week to week, right? There's no neutral. There's no neutral. This demon comes back and he sees this perfect home. This guy's a good citizen, he's a good father, he's a good husband, he's a good employee, but his heart is empty. And so what does the demon do? He goes and sees this perfect place. He goes and gets seven of his buddies. All eight of them move in. And this guy's in awful shape now. And he ends up worse than he was before. So what do we do with this? Listen, church. Like, your heart has to be full of the love of God and love of neighbor. If it's not filled with that, then it's just waiting for evil. It's a tragic story. It's a simple story. But if we aren't filling our hearts with love of Jesus and love of neighbor, it will be filled with Satan. Because there's no neutral. You know, this is... This is a direct condemnation, a couple of things. One, of, of modern society, right? It, uh, we live in a society right now that thinks like that, that neutral is, is a good thing, right? That we're here to be objective, and that we can kind of sit on the fence and look and go, oh, that's good, and that's good, and, and we're inclusive, right, of all these different ideas, and this idea is okay, and that idea is okay, right? And, and, and the ideal, enlightened, kind of inclusive, tolerant Western person is this professional fence sitter. Uh, Jesus says, that's a dangerous place to be because there is no good without God. And if your heart is empty of Jesus and God, it's ripe for the picking for evil. There's no neutral. You can't sit on the fence. Verse 30, whoever is not with me, this is Jesus talking, is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. It's also a condemnation of the Pharisees, right? It, it hits home for us because our society kind of prides ourselves. We love to be fence sitters, right? And everything, everything's okay. I can have one foot in this world and one foot in that world, and, and that's the ideal way to live. But it, it's also a condemnation of the very people that, that Jesus is coming into contact with because the Pharisees, they were all buttoned up, right? They were swept. They were clean. They were in order. They looked good. They did all the religious stuff. They checked all the boxes. But there was no Jesus or God in there. Their heads were full of the Bible. Their hearts were full of Satan. And that's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Heads full of traditions, heads full of scripture, heads full of extra biblical stuff, hearts full of hate, and criticism, and condemnation bitterness. And Jesus is trying to get through them, right? And I, and I think this is, this is one of those things where, you know, sometimes the Bible holds us up a, a mirror and says, what does your heart look like? What's your heart look like? Right? If it's not soft, if it's not filled towards love, towards your, your church family and the lost in the community, that that's a heart in danger, Without the love of God, without the love of Jesus, there's plenty of room for Satan to come in. 
Listen, this is one of two times that Matthew records that Jesus is going to reach out to these people. This is, is probably the biggest and most expansive. This is the longest kind of running thing where Jesus is trying to break through to these people, uh, and he doesn't. He will try again in chapter 15 as he challenges some of their traditions and commandments and, and what it means to be defiled and what it means to be holy. And he'll hold up kind of the faith of a Canaanite woman, right? And he'll feed thousands, right? And he's trying to break through. But when he gets to chapter 16, and we'll see 16.1, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? Now the other side's joined them too began to test him, show me a sign, same question, right? Jesus hasn't broken through at all. Verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation, that sounds similar, doesn't it? An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus repeats his answer, and then there's this devastating sentence, and he left them and departed. Done. And the next section is he is warning his disciples, beware of being around them. And that's really the end of his outreach to them. So what then does Jesus begin to do? Let's pick up in verse 46. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him, but he replied, to the man who told him, who's my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here's my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and my sister and my brother. Sorry, got that backwards. Brother and mother, brother and sister and mother. Yes. Jesus begins to form the church. The antagonists have formed. The chief protagonist has been here. But now his people begin to form while he was still speaking, right? Jesus is having this running kind of confrontation with the Pharisees. His mother, Mary, Mary, his mom, shows up. Mom shows up. Son, what are you doing, right? His brothers are with him. The way it's written in the Greek, it, it could mean his brothers or it could mean all his siblings. It, we know Jesus had both brothers and sisters, half brothers, half sisters, right? Mary's, you know, Jesus is, is Mary's full biological son, but not Joseph because he's born of the Holy Spirit. The rest of his brothers and sisters are Mary and Joseph's kids, right? So they're half brothers and sisters. Uh, we know that there's a bunch of them. The other gospels tell us. So they're trying to get to him. Uh, they're trying to break through to him. So they send some guy in. His mother even can't even get in the house that he's in. Uh, and he says, hey, your family's outside and they're asking about you. And Jesus points around to the room. And Jesus says, who's my mother and who are my brothers? And he points at his disciples. And keep in mind, there's men and there's women following Jesus at this point. And women were not the apostles. They were not part of the 12, but they were very much part of the following. Jesus pointed around and he goes, this is my family. These are my brothers and my sisters and my mothers. And he makes a very important point here and a point that we all need to hear. And this is the one I'll end on, right? He's got the bonds of belief Bonds of belief are stronger than the bonds of blood. The bonds of belief are stronger than the bonds of blood. Now, I want to caveat it. Jesus is not saying, right, that your biological or adoptive families are not important. Not at all. Jesus will criticize the Pharisees in chapter 15 because they're not taking seriously their obligations to their parents. Right? Jesus will, from the cross, one of the last things he does is give over care of his mother for, for he is the oldest son. He's responsible for it. He doesn't give over care of his mother to his unbelieving brothers and sisters at that point. Why? Because the bonds of belief are stronger than the bonds of blood. Who does he give her to? He gives her to John. Incidentally, the only apostle that will live out a natural life long enough to take care of his mom. Jesus is not anti-family. Your family is important. Multiple commands in Scripture to love them and care for them and support them. But what Jesus is saying here, saying ultimately at the end of the day, bonds of faith are greater than the bonds of blood. 
This is the embryo of the church. This community that's forming around Jesus after the resurrection and Pentecost will be born and it will be the church. And he's saying this Christian's relationship with other Christians, especially those right around them, are as important or more important than your biological family. Listen, the people you see around you right now, these people are important. Right? Jesus says, this is your family. Like You look at them. These are the people that you are to love. These are the people that you are to encourage. These are the people that you are to support. These are the people that you are to pray for. These are the people that you serve with. Right? These are the people. Right? And Jesus is, he's just made reference and, and, and it's in its embryonic form. Jesus goes, this is the church. This is the church. And to an extent, every other Christian out there, whether they're in North America, South America, Africa, Asia, doesn't matter. They're your brother and sister too. But this is the group. These are your brothers and sisters. To love them, support them, pray for them, encourage them. This following Jesus stuff, man, this is hard. It's hard. So I want you to just take some time today. The worship team's going to come and they're going to play. We're going to go to the Lord's table. We're going to come to gather as a family. Communion is this beautiful like, look of, of, of God's family gathering around the Lord's table. Hold the mirror up to you today. Is that you? Right? Are you trying to sit on the fence? Is your heart hard? Like, do you love these people like you should love these people? If not, now's the time to go to God. Now's the time to go to Jesus and say, Lord, change my heart. I'm going to pray for us. Aaron's going to come up and lead us.